Thank you to everyone who's joined. I'm so excited to welcome you all today to the first ever MIT Abstract. Welcome to the brand new school year. Welcome to the fall for many of us. We are so, so, so excited to have you here um, and invite you to this fantastic brand new series. So we're very excited to kick it off. I'm your host, Fatima Hussein, and I'm a PhD student here at MIT, and I study ancient Earth um, and what it was like millions and billions of years ago. And I'm super stoked today to introduce you to the series, MIT Abstracts. But for those of you who aren't familiar with our naming and aren't familiar with abstracts, an abstract is usually a snapshot um, of a paper that tells you about what that paper is going to include. So it's really like that introductory summary. And for those of you who haven't seen a research paper yet, I've actually included in that highlighted portion on your screens what an abstract looks like. So as you can see, it's pretty short. And for this series, we're really excited to bring you all abstracts of amazing, inspiring folks at MIT. Some of these folks may be students, some of these folks may be researchers, but nonetheless, they are all absolute rock star experts in what they do. So I'm really excited to kick this series off with you all today. So a quick note before I have the pleasure of introducing um, our fantastic first guest for this series, I want you to keep in mind the Q&A um, button at the bottom of your screens through Zoom. I've noticed a lot of you have already started using it. Um, if you have questions for the speaker, you're curious about something the speaker says during their talk, go ahead and type it in the chat so we can go over it in the Q&A. And if the question you've asked is already up and someone beat you to it, go ahead and upvote that question. This will make sure that you have a better chance of hearing it asked um, during the Q&A. So we're gonna have a little bit of time after the talk for you to fill these questions in and type them in, but you're welcome to do it during the talk as well. So now I have the absolute pleasure of introducing our first guest for uh, this amazing MIT Abstract series. Natalia Guerrero. She is an exoplaneteer, which she'll tell you a little bit about. She's a researcher extraordinaire here at MIT, and she actually completed her undergraduate degree in physics from MIT and graduated here in 2014. So you're talking to a real life MIT alum as well. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now um, and allow Natalia to take it over and, and take it away, Natalia. My name is Natalia Guerrero. And while I was at MIT as a student, I was basically trying to explore art and science and as many things as possible. I studied to be a physicist. I was looking for dark matter in an underground lab in Southern Ontario. That's this picture on the top left. Um, I was also exploring what science communication means, how to convey science to the public. And I helped record a video exploring some of the properties of capacitors and electromagnetism. That's this picture on the right. Uh, but I was also really interested in how to blend science and art. And so I hosted my first radio show when I was in college. And it was a show about, um, that was a, a space opera. It was exploring what it would be like to travel to a distant planet and doing this through radio theater. So after four years, I graduated uh, with a physics degree but I didn't stop doing both science and art. I started working on the NASA test mission. I got to see its launch from Cape Canaveral, Florida. And I started looking for ways to communicate the science that I was doing with art. And so this was through exploring different modes of photography and also music. And this has actually uh, ended up being something that I'm really passionate about. In the last year, I worked together with an ensemble of professional vocalists and a composer to write music about my research. And in both astronomy and in art, uh, we're trying to ask big questions. And I think one of the biggest questions is, what are we doing here? How did we get here? And we start answering that question by looking at ourselves, looking at the Earth. Here I have a, a picture of the Earth taken from space. And, and what do we see? We see the Earth, we see the brown pieces of land, but we also see water. 
And in the very thin and precious atmosphere, we see that we have clouds, we have air and water. And these are the important ingredients for life that we have here on Earth. But if we look outside of Earth and outside of the planets are in our own solar system, we have discovered thousands of planets around other stars. We call these exoplanets, a star that's or a planet that's orbiting a star that's not our sun. So what can we learn about ourselves and what we're doing here from these relatives of Earth, these exoplanets that look nothing like us? Well, first we have to study them. We have to get a better understanding of what they are. And so we do that with spacecraft and telescopes like TESS, which is the mission that I work on. Uh, TESS is a really powerful telescope that has four wide angle cameras that can stare at one patch of the sky and look at it in detail for 27 days, almost a month. One camera has such a wide field of view that it can fit an entire constellation in it. It's using its huge field of view to study millions of stars. So I was part of the camera testing team, which meant that I got to go into the lab every day and make sure that these cameras would work when we launched them into space. Part of testing the cameras is that each time you run a test, you need to take a picture first thing to make sure that the camera is working. So if we're going to be taking a picture with the camera, we might as well pose for it, right? So this was our, what I like to call our $337 million selfie because that was how much the mission was. And each of the astronomers in this photograph is an expert in her own right. Each does something that is somehow related to exoplanet research or the test mission. Whether it's telescopes or stars or exoplanets, we all contribute to the work that TESS is doing to discover the worlds beyond our own. So we knew that the cameras worked on the ground, but it was still very dramatic to see them launched into space on a rocket and we would never see them again, but we knew that they were going to work. So when the cameras got to space, we had a very dramatic afternoon in the conference room when we got back the first image and opened it up and saw, wow, here are the millions of stars Tess is looking at. This is, this is what Tess is going to do and the cameras are working exactly the way we hoped they would. Here in this picture, you can see that it's divided up into 16 squares. And so each camera has four sensors in it. And so four cameras and four sensors, 16 squares. You can see on the left that Tess in this image was looking at part of the Milky Way, our own galaxy, but you can also see the Large Magellanic Cloud, which is a huge cluster of stars that's visible from the Southern Hemisphere. So let's take a closer look at one of these images. You can see that each one of these blobs of light is actually a star, and the one in the bottom right is a really, really bright star. So its light is spilling out of its pixels into other pixels nearby. And TESS actually doesn't take pictures in color. It's not like a phone camera. It takes pictures in black and white because what it's trying to measure is how much light is coming from the star, not necessarily the color. So we have to send telescopes to space in order to study exoplanets, but we're really lucky in our own solar system that we can just send missions to other planets and they can land there. I was able to go this summer to the Cape Canaveral launch site uh, which is just an hour from my hometown, Orlando, to see the Perseverance rover launch back in July. Perseverance is going to Mars and it's going to study the Martian surface, looking for signs of ancient life, kind of like what Fatima does. And it's going to do that by roaming around a dried up lake bed uh, that's now a crater. So this was an amazing experience and all part of how space exploration in different ways can help us learn about the world around us. So back to TESS. How do we use telescopes to discover planets around other stars? How do we see them? Well, we don't actually see the planet. We're not able to take a picture of them. Our telescopes aren't good enough yet. What we do see is that when a planet crosses in front of its host star or transits, it blocks out a tiny amount of that star's light. And so a small planet will make a small transit and a big planet will make a big transit. And we call this change in brightness over time, like in this graph, a light curve. So if we look at a given 
real data set, we see that it's not a nice clean curve. It's a bunch of changes in light over time. And when a planet crosses in front of the star, we can see that it, there's a tiny dip in that star's light. It's not smooth. And it's, and I think this is a good example that real world data is, is not as pretty as we'd like it to be often. And then there's other things in space that block each other's light. For example, two stars that orbit each other can block out each other's light. This is called an eclipsing binary. But the shape of their light curve is a little bit different. So we're able to use that to distinguish between a planet transiting its host star and two stars going around each other. So TESS looks at millions upon millions of stars. So we use computers to help us narrow down from a huge number of stars that potentially have exoplanets to just a few hundred that we can look at one at a time. And so the team that I manage does this every day. We look at planets that have reports just like this in this type of interface. And we say, based on its light curve, we think this is a planet. We think it has this size. Uh, we think it's this temperature. We think it's this far away from our host star. And we do this over and over until we build up a catalog of exoplanets. And the first times we started doing this was really fun. It was amazing to learn that just from these points on a page that we could learn so much about a planet. So over the course of the last two years, TESS has been mapping nearly the entire sky and finding exoplanets all over. TESS has found nearly 1,600 planet candidates in the last two years. And so these are filling up the entire sky and giving astronomers all over the world tons of things that they can look for. And so we can better understand these planets with other telescopes. TESS tells us a few features of each individual exoplanet, but we can learn so much more when we look more closely with other telescopes. We can learn about the planet's atmosphere, what it's made of, how heavy it is, so TESS is really just the starting point, and it's been such an amazing experience getting to work on a mission that is helping us see who we are based on all of the exoplanets around us. Great. Okay. So, Natalia, are you ready for some amazing questions? Yes. Okay. So, first of all, this is actually my question. Could you tell us where you are right now? I see you're surrounded by a lot of boxes. Are you in the lab? <laughs> no, actually, I am in the supply room for an arts nonprofit. My mom is the director of this arts education and outreach program, and uh, this is where we keep all of our art supplies. Oh my goodness, so the, the art genes seem to run in the family. Yeah, actually behind me is a work that um, she made that I helped her with. Wow, that's super cool. Okay, yeah. I'm gonna kick off with an amazing Nord Anglia student question. Great. So they wanted to know, do you ever wanna go visit one of these exoplanets, these planet candidates, and do you plan to go to space at some point? I definitely would love to visit an exoplanet. If there was a spaceship that could just like fly me there in an hour, I would be very excited. Um, I've always thought it would be an amazing experience to go to space, like even if it's going to the moon or going to Mars, um, that would be just so cool. And I think that the technology to go to other planets, even just to send little robots or probes is, is in development. So maybe it'll be one of you who gets to send the first spacecraft out of this world, out of the solar system. Did you hear that, Nord Anglia kids and teachers? It could be one of you. So definitely ask Natalia your question so she can give you all the details on how to do it. Um, we have a, a student who's asked about the sizes of these planet candidates. I mean, What's like the smallest and the biggest one you found? What's that range of sizes, just so we understand maybe compared to Earth? What are we looking at here? That's actually a great question. So we've found planets that are smaller than Earth, maybe half the size of Earth. So a little bit smaller than Mars, um, around Mercury, Venus size. And then we've also found planets that are up to 20 times the size of Jupiter. 
And it's really interesting because there's a huge debate that often happens in exoplanets of when does a star stop being a star and stop being a planet? There's a, an object in the middle called a brown dwarf that's sort of not quite one or the other. Interesting, okay. Um, we have a question from someone who wants to know um, how, how do you, how does the camera capture these pictures if it's super cold and under some pretty non-ideal conditions? What's, how does that work? That's a great question. We had to test those cameras exactly for that reason. And often they have little heaters on them that even though it's minus 75 degrees Celsius in space, we can keep the cameras at a temperature where they can operate. But actually cameras like it cold. Most of the sensors that we're using because of how the electronics work, they perform much better when they're kept really, really cold. Well, that's interesting. I hadn't realized that. Um, another question we have about the satellite is, so, you know, you've sent tests up. Now, what happens if you need to update tests or need to conduct a repair? How, how would that work? So we're really, we designed tests to be as stable as it could over a really long period of time. It uses very little fuel and there's no moving parts in the cameras. It's all electronic. So we can actually talk to tests and we do several times a month and send it software updates when it sends us back data. Got it. Okay. Um, I have a question that you may have many answers to, but a, a Nord Anglia student asks, were there any particular difficulties you faced during this project or during working on tests? Maybe you could give it a, like one anecdote. <laughs> I think the, um, the most challenging part was learning and reinventing what um, looking for exoplanets was. TESS has a bigger um, sibling, Kepler. The Kepler mission was another telescope that discovered thousands of exoplanets but they're different, just like siblings are different. And so learning what we could from Kepler and putting it into how we search for exoplanets with tests, because we don't want to copy Kepler, but we do want to learn what we could. So getting that sort of history from that telescope was a big challenge, but a lot of fun. I think it tends to be the case that the most challenging things do lead to the most fun through the road, I think, at least in yeah. my some research too. Now we have an amazing question from Jeff and it's a little bit more about you, Natalia. Could you share a quick deeper background for these amazing Nord Anglia students on the call and their teachers? How did you become interested in astronomy and art in the first place? And when did you know MIT was right for you? So could you just walk us through Natalia's personal journey in that way? Sure. So my favorite subject until maybe my third year in high school was actually English. I thought I was going to grow up and be a writer. And so it was a huge surprise to me when I started my calculus class and started learning calculus and was like, this is amazing. I love this problem solving aspect of this class and was like, OK, I want to keep doing this. And so that was when I decided that I wanted to maybe study astronomy or astrophysics because I'd always loved looking at the stars, staying up late and looking at the moon. And so I, I thought this could be a really interesting thing to do. And so I decided though that I didn't want to give up on either one. I wanted to keep doing both. So I decided MIT was the place where I would feel at home and feel really challenged to, to try things that are hard, like calculus and solving these big problems in physics. But um, I also wanted to keep writing and keep exploring artistically because I found that the more I learned in science, the more I actually got ideas for making pieces of writing or pieces of theater or photography. And I found that it was um, one fed the other. And so I wanted to keep doing that and keep using them to, to, to keep that cycle going. That is super duper cool. And can you tell us a little bit about how you're able to balance those two things today as well? Like the science, I mean, I love it. It's so impressive, but how, how do you do it and also find exoplanets at the same time? It's a challenge. Um, I think it come, often it'll come from the science. Actually, I'll be doing something, writing a piece of code or looking at a piece of data and I'll say, 
actually, you know what, this would be like a really interesting question to ask artistically and then I'll write it down and then I'll, usually when I am doing something like this, thinking about communicating science to the public is when I'll say, okay, I need to take some time to figure out how to organize this idea artistically. And that was how the concert was born, the uh, Songs from Extrasolar Spaces was saying, I want to make the research that we've been talking about at this Exoplanets conference accessible to everyone so they can be as amazed as we are as astronomers with all of this data. And so I worked with musicians and composers to make something that would convey that sense of wonder. That's amazing. Um, we have a, a question about uh, these planet candidates that you're finding. So have you found evidence of life on any of them? Not yet. So TESS actually is not able to measure any of the things that you would need to get clues about whether there's life on another planet. For that, we need much different telescopes that are looking at the wavelengths of light, what color the light is, and also um, in the wider electromagnetic spectrum, um, if it's infrared, what temperature the star is and uh, what temperature the planet is. Uh, to see if it has an atmosphere, and if it has an atmosphere, what's in it? Because Venus and Earth are the same size, but Venus and Earth look way different. Venus cannot have life on it, whereas Earth, we're here. So there's a lot of additional study that needs to be done, and so there's telescopes that are launching in the next several decades, or that should be able to help us answer some of those questions for these planets. I'm, I'm super excited for those future launches as well. You know, it's, we have a common goal of, of searching habitability in our universe. So that's, I'm super stoked for that. We have a fantastic question from uh, Freddie and he's wondering, do you have any advice for people for when it comes to being successful? I think in your academics and research, he says, by the way, you're such an inspiration to me. Um, and he loves to, to watch the videos that this collaboration produces. So um, what would you say to Freddie? What is, how, how can Freddie um, be successful? What should he be thinking about? I think that astronomy or any scientific field is also all about having a big toolbox. And so I would recommend doing as much as you can to fill up that toolbox, whether it's working on communication by writing articles for your school newspaper, or it's taking math classes or trying a robotics class. Um, never, never stop filling up the toolbox and even adding in things that you're not sure if they'll be useful right now, they might be useful later. Like I took a film photography class because I just wanted to understand how it worked. And then it turned out that I was working on a telescope and the, the science behind how both of those things work is not that different. So it ended up being a really helpful tool. Oh, that's amazing. So um, folks, fill up your toolboxes and, and gather all those skills. Um, we have a couple folks who have asked, um, how many years have you been studying? <laughs> that's a good question. So I had 12 years through high school, plus four of college. And then I've been doing research since then. So that's six more. So I think I've been sort of studying all my life and I don't plan to stop because it's, it's so fun to learn new things. Yeah, it definitely is. So one thing I wanna ask about, and it's related to NASA, we have so many folks, so many students from North Anglia asking questions about collaborating with NASA. So what's it like to work with NASA? And can you tell us if you've ever gotten to visit any NASA facilities as part of this? It is so cool to get to work with NASA because they send people to space. Um, I really loved being able to attend both the test launch and the Perseverance launch because it meant I got to go to the launch site at Cape Canaveral in Florida where they launched all of the missions that were for the space shuttle that sent astronauts out into space. And that was just an amazing way to feel like I am I'm walking around I'm parking my car in a historical parking lot and that was the that was just unbelievable but also when we were doing press for tests we traveled to the NASA facility that is partnered with MIT NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center and so I traveled there and I worked with their communications team 
to talk about tests to news media and reporters. And that was also a really exciting and really different thing to, to be a scientist representing a mission to the media from a NASA center. I'm super, super jealous that you got to go see the launch. I was watching it live and I hope many of the folks on this call got to do it too, because that's just absolutely extraordinary every time. And just to think about all the amazing science and engineering that goes into it. Oh my gosh, it like seriously blows my mind. So that's super cool. Um, we have a, a question for um, from a North Anglia student and, and they're wondering, what keeps you motivated to study and how do you keep yourself from procrastinating? Because I'm sure you have a lot of things to do and we all struggle with this. So I'm really interested in this answer as well. Oh, that's a great question. Um, I definitely am a procrastinator, so I relate. Um, I think it's the idea that this is brand new. Every time Tess downloads an image, it's, it's a brand new image. Nobody has ever looked at the sky in this particular way before. And there are things in this data that nobody has discovered yet. And that is the, the fire that on the days that I'm not really feeling like going to work or the days that make me wake up and say, no, we, there are things to discover today. Let's go, let's go log onto the computer. Let's go look at some data. And I mean, that's, that's super exciting. And I think that I relate to that really heavily because right after this talk, I'm going to go run into the lab and do some science. So the um, lab. yeah. Um, do you have a favorite exoplanet? Oh, and why? This is a hard question. I think I'm like a parent when they're asked who's their favorite child, like they're all my favorite. Um, I think I am always excited when we find a planet that is sort of similar to Earth, an Earth sibling, uh, because it it helps me sort of answer that question of like, okay, so like, what is what is it about our solar system that's so weird and so different that we have life in this very obvious way? Um, for example, the the abstract that Fatima linked at the beginning, um, I was really excited when we found that planet because it was that research team had done a lot of additional observations to better understand that yes, this is a habitable zone planet. And if we, if we look at it again, we can learn so much more about it. So whenever a planet sort of reveals a little bit about itself and then there's more that we need to discover, I'm always really excited about that. That's fantastic. And we have uh, a student who wonders, you know, speaking of these exoplanets and potential favorites there, could there ever be an exoplanet Natalia? Are you ever allowed to name one after yourself? I wish. Unfortunately, we, we don't get to name them anything fun or exciting. We usually number them sequentially just to keep them straight because there's thousands of them. Um, often they'll have several names too because Tess will have looked at these stars, but they've been looked at with previous surveys or they're a really bright star that's very well known. So it's difficult sometimes because the um, a given star is known by so many names. So we have to keep those straight as well. Got it. And you know, in the course of, of you know doing this incredible research, one of our students from North Anglia is asking, "Do you do this all day long? Like, what does a typical day look like for you? Like, do you like eat dinner and you're like, all right, off to find exoplanets? I mean, what does that look like for you, Natalia?" Work-life balance is very important to me. And I think for every astronomer who, who um, is passionate about living a full life. And so I actually, I've been at home in my parents' house since um, the start of the, the quarantine in the US. And that was back in March. And it's just been a really great opportunity to, to spend that time. So I actually spend um, a little bit of the morning with them. And then I go into my office and work and then come out, hang out with my family again, and then work for the rest of the afternoon. And then the rest of the evening is time for, for me and to spend with my family because this is this is how I, I replenish my, my energy and go to sleep and rest. And so I think the some nights I'm like really excited about something or I have something due and I have to stay up late. But for the most part, I try to, to have it all balanced and I'll be part of, part of a cycle. 
Yeah, that's super good advice, folks. Um, it's never too early to start thinking about your work-life balance. So you also have to do really fun things um, like art and singing like Natalia. So keep that in mind as you kick off this fall semester, y'all. Okay, so Natalia, we have a couple of questions about Perseverance since you got to go see that launch in person, which is so amazing. And again, I cannot express how jealous I am. That's so cool. Um, one of our Nord Anglia students is asking, in the future, do you think humans could live on Mars? What do you think about that? I think that it was really interesting to see some of the experiments that were on board Perseverance. Like one of the technologies developed actually with people at MIT was this uh, module called MOXIE that basically works like an artificial tree. It takes the, the thin carbon dioxide that's in Mars's atmosphere and converts it into oxygen. And so this is for people to breathe, but also for uh, providing rocket fuel for leaving Mars. So I think that it's definitely going to be part of our future. I think we're going to become even more creative in figuring out how to live in such a challenging environment. That's super cool. And a lot of the, the Nord Anglia students and teachers on this call will recognize Moxie from one of the Into the Void challenges this year. So they're actually studying that and they're thinking about the dust problem. So I think that's just super fabulous that you brought that up and are thinking about that. So. I get the sense that some of the students asking questions in the Q&A are really interested in attending MIT in the future. And one of the questions that's come up that I'm also really curious about is, what is like, what was the most challenging part of your time at MIT? Was it like classes and homework and stuff? Or like, what, what, what was it for you, Natalia? Man, so MIT looks for students who can learn from and recover from failure and can overcome difficult things. It's looking for grit. And I think it's because MIT is a really challenging environment. All of the teachers are, all of the professors are showing you material and saying, this is how this field works. This is how this part of the universe is working. Let's try and understand this. And yeah, the coursework was very, very challenging. And just all of this information coming at me at once, it was, it was really overwhelming. MIT is often referred to as the fire hose. And I think that's a very apt description uh, because it's, it's a lot of work. Um, but the most uh, fantastic part of MIT by far was the people. And that I was going through this really intense experience with all of these other brilliant people who are passionate and curious in their own way, but we're all there because we wanna learn and we really like sort of this cycle of getting really overwhelmed and then resting and then coming back to it, this sort of problem solving cycle where none of us really wanna quit because it's, it's just so interesting. Um, so yeah, I think the most challenging part was the getting used to that feeling of failure and that feeling of, oh, I did really badly on this test, but I still wanna learn this thing. Um, yeah, so that is, I think that's true for life though as well, is, is learning how to manage failure is really important. Definitely, I think I fail like once a week in the lab, probably if I had to be <laughs> totally honest with everyone. Now, Natalia, we're running out of time here, but I wanted to ask you one last question and it's how can the future exoplaneteers on this call, these Nord Anglia students, how can they get involved in the kind of research you do? Can they start planet hunting tonight? Yes, you can totally participate. One of the amazing things about astronomy data is that we can put it online for everybody to see. So there is a program run through the Zooniverse organization called Planet Hunters Tests. So if you go to planethunters.org, it is possible to look at real test data, real test light curves, and identify individual transits. And sometimes those transits end up being exoplanet transits, and the result that you helped look at gets turned into a paper. And that's happened already. The graduate student, Nora Eisner, at Oxford, who helps run this program, has authored a bunch of papers with all of these co-authors who contributed to the project through Planet Hunters. Oh my goodness, that's, that's fantastic. So that's a, really, that's a really amazing example of citizen science. So yeah. um, that's super amazing. And, and we'll, 
we'll try to share the link uh, in the recording of the video. So for those of you who didn't catch it, we will be posting the link later on. So now, Natalia, I have to thank you for your amazing time and insights and for walking us through the universe with your work. Um, we're so grateful to you for inspiring these amazing North Anglia students. I just know that we have future, exo future exoplanet tears on this call now. I, I really think you've done it. So folks, I'm so excited to talk to you again soon. I'm going to share my screen for a moment and tell you a little bit about our next talk. So next time, next month, we will have um, Yo Wu. He is an inventor and robotics engineer. So he is a robot expert and he's designed some really, really cool devices. He actually graduated from MIT with his PhD in engineering in 2018. So be sure to join us um, for his amazing talk as well. And before we go, I wanted to first make a huge thank you to Natalia for coming today and sharing her expertise with us. I want to also thank Nord Anglia uh, and the MIT Nord Anglia collaboration specifically. Um, they're the whole reason this series is possible. It's the whole reason we can bring abstracts of these amazing folks from MIT straight to the screens of these Nord Anglia students around the world. Um, so I, I really wanna thank them and I wanna thank um, my colleagues uh, in the collaboration for for their endless support. And with that, we will um, conclude our first ever MIT abstract. And I hope to see you all in the next one. Thank you so much again, Natalia. You were great. Thanks. All right. Thanks for having me. Of course. Goodbye, everyone.